The Earth is more unstable now. It wobbles more than it used to. The atmosphere is speeding up and the Earth is slowing down. The Earth's core is getting hotter. The magnetic north is changing. The sun is more active and older than we once thought. Everything is more unpredictable. And humans seem always willing to push things to the limit. The late Carl Sagan said, we've arranged a global civilization in which most crucial elements profoundly depend on science and technology. We've also arranged things so that almost no one understands science or technology. We might get away with it for a while, but sooner or later, this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. Imagine the Earth's atmosphere, also known as the ionosphere, as a thick soap bubble. It is a membrane, a natural electrically charged shield around the Earth, protecting all life from deadly solar radiation. We have to have the atmosphere uh, for survival. I don't think we should do anything to damage it. Without the ionosphere, I'd be fried, you'd be fried. All life on Earth would be fried. In 1912, Nikola Tesla, a visionary genius, saw ways to tame the sky, to make the atmosphere glow. He developed alternating current, high-frequency radio technology, and free energy. He experimented with both high and low frequencies and electromagnetic waves. He envisioned altering the weather and creating shields around the Earth to protect us from missiles. And he claimed he knew how to split the Earth in two. In 1985, Bernard Eastland applied for patents that could make some of these ideas real. Many claim that these patents have become the blueprint for HARP, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. ARCO originally approached me in 1984 to find a use for the natural gas on the north slope of Alaska, which they could not sell. To give you a feel for how much gas they asked me to find an application for, it was enough gas to produce all the electricity in the United States for a full year. I originated some ideas for military applications and beneficial civilian applications in which that gas would be converted into electricity and then used to power some gigantic antennas. What does HARP do? HARP is, uh, is a large antenna where we beam radio frequency energy up into the upper atmosphere and we create on a small scale what the sun normally does. And the reason we're trying to do this is because when, when you have disturbances in the ionosphere, we can't communicate with our satellites. HARP began with a congressional insertion uh, in the appropriations bill of, of fiscal year 1990. In essence, Congress directed the Defense Department to explore the potential for using um, the auroral regions um, for uh, improving communications and navigation and um, surveillance. Um, from there, uh, the assignment came that the Navy and the Air Force were to manage the program. It is uh, people from those two organizations that have worked together for the past seven years. Applications uh, discussed in the patents included destroying missiles. Communications control and disruption were included. There were some other ideas both to possibly modify weather and finally uh, to lift a portion of the upper atmosphere further out into space where hopefully it would be able to deflect missile trajectories. What we do by, by beaming up radio frequency up into the ionosphere, um, that radio frequency, when it hits molecules of atmosphere, it tends to make the subatomic particles inside move faster, and that increases their temperature. So you can bring their temperature up to uh, 1,600 degrees or so, which is normally what the sun does to those particles at that atmosphere. The ionosphere of the Earth has got enormous amount of energy. There are 8,000 thunderstorms going on all over the Earth at any given moment. There are millions of amperes of electricity uh, pouring to the Earth from uh, lightning strikes. And HARP could create a trigger effect. 
1983, I did radio tomography with 30 watts, looking for oil in the ground. I found 26 oil wells over a nine-state area, and 100% of the time was accurate with just 30 watts of power beaming straight into solid rock. HARP uses a billion watts beam straight into the ionosphere for experiments. Picture these strings on the piano as layers of the earth. Each one has its own frequency. What we used to do is beam radio waves into the ground and it would vibrate any strings that were present in the ground. We might get a sound back like and we'd say, that's natural gas. We might get a sound back like and we'd say that's crude oil we were able to identify each frequency. We accomplished this with just 30 watts of radio power. If you do this with a billion watts, the vibrations are so violent that the entire piano would shake. In fact, the whole house would shake. In fact, the vibrations could be so severe underground that could even cause an earthquake. While we feel that HARP is a unique facility, it's not the only one like it in the world. Uh, HARP has some, some capabilities that uh, we feel are better than some of the others. You can change the frequencies, um, you can shift the beam so that you can, you can move it from one part of the, of the ionosphere to another, and it has quite a bit more power than some of the other facilities throughout the world that are doing the same kinds of research. I chose a what's called a phased array antenna for the patents because it can be aimed. Picture holding your microwave oven in your hands with the door open. Then you can move it around and send those microwaves different directions. And for these applications where I wanted precise control of where the power was, uh, I felt that was the best type of antenna to use. And that is the kind that HARP has built. What we can do with an antenna is change the, the portion of the sky into which we insert the energy. HARP can create some of the effects that the sun creates that are similar to the aurora borealis. HARP can paint um, designs in the sky, if you will. You know, it can take the beam and move it in, in any pattern that, you, that the scientist who's doing the experiment might want to do. What I'm holding in my hands is an electrodeless lamp. In it, I have a low atmosphere gas, somewhat similar to the atmosphere above the Earth. I'm now going to put this in the microwave oven, which will irradiate it with about one watt per square centimeter. You know, you put one watt out and you've got the fields necessary to break down the air, or whatever happens. And you see all of the motion of the plasma. That's typical of what will happen at high altitude, where the ionosphere gets irradiated with these big beams. That was one watt per centimeter. HARP focuses 3.6 million watts and squeezes it into a billion watt or gigawatt beam. We're squeezing the megawatts into a narrow beam, then in a very tiny area, you can create an, what's it called an effective gigawatt. Is HARP safe? Yes, HARP is safe. The Earth is a web of interconnections. How do we know what we're doing when we blast the upper atmosphere with a huge amount of energy? It takes a tiny, tiny amount of energy to release a huge amount of energy. It's the same as, as a bullet, for example, if uh, you have the primer on the back of a, of a bullet and that primer releases a tiny amount of energy, but it triggers the larger power in the bullet itself. And HARP uh, is playing with the energy system of the Earth. In the HARP program, we have, I believe right now, 18 different colleges and universities that are working the, the program with us. Um, university scientists are interested because they're studying science, and this is, this is a major effect uh, on the Earth, and so they want to know more about what it is and what it does. HARP has no effect on, on the Earth. HARP began in the 1980s, and we were just beginning to learn about chaos theory, how a tiny stimulus can change the dynamics of a living system like the human body or the whole living earth. I don't think the people who developed HARP were even aware of that science or its impact in the life sciences. Today, our knowledge is much bigger about how tiny effects can drastically shift the health or well-being of a living thing.
it is possible with a big beam to take a part of that upper atmosphere and push it out for it. What they're not paying any attention to is what's happening to the ionosphere while it's being held 80 miles out into space by this high energy beam. It's heating up. And all of the molecules in that ionosphere region are absorbing energy out of that radio beam. And if they pick the right frequency to push that plume out into space, that energy may discharge back out of the ionosphere, back down the radio beam, and strike the Earth. And it would be about 100 times the energy released out of a thunderbolt. And that's how much energy would be released. In certain applications, the military acknowledges that it can literally lift the ionosphere. And what they say is, it's not a problem. It's a short period of time. Yet, when you lift the ionosphere up, the lower atmosphere rushes in and fills that void, which changes localized weather patterns. HARP papers say that they intend to lift up a part of the ionosphere, which creates a, a hole, and they say that it heals over quickly. But what if happens if you create enough holes that it just can't quite take care of it fast enough? As far as creating a hole, it, to me, it's, it's the analogy of you put your hand in water, and yeah, you're taking up space, but when you pull it out, it goes back together again. Same way the ionosphere would work. If the hole means that the, uh, the, the uh, neutral density has been somewhat modified, then, then if you want to call that a hole, maybe uh, that's fine. The hole would be at least 30 miles long, half a mile deep, 50 to 60 miles above the Earth. I imagine there, there are hundreds of satellites that have interactions with the ionosphere. They're all doing their lo own local modification of the ionosphere. They're all creating their own holes. <laughs> satellites, rockets, uh, space shuttle flights, not just HARP, but many technologies out there in space are creating holes in heaven. As to this question of injecting more high energy particles into the Earth's electrical system, the ionosphere is a dynamic system, ever moving, ever changing. I don't think anyone on this planet really knows the point where enough is enough. This was the planning document that um, really brought HARP into being, and the absolute requirements ran from one gigawatt, which is a billion watts, all the way up to 10 uh, billion watts of effective radiated power with a, with a desired level of 100 billion watts. At its biggest size suggested, if you beamed it for an hour and a half, that would equal the energy in a hydrogen bomb. It's just a person's concept of what might possibly be done. Doesn't necessarily mean the government endorsed it or not. What are the, what's the power when it pulses? And I can't find that in any of the documents that I've looked at. If you have a very small battery, you can put it in a small pen light and turn it on and have for some time a little bit of light. You can take the exactly same battery and put it in your camera. And when you flash that camera, the light will blind you. The nature of radar and these uh, electromagnetic supplies is they can usually be pulsed. So one very good question for people to ask is what is the peak power of that antenna when it pulses at its full capability? Pulsing it doesn't matter. To make it bigger, all they'd have to do is add additional elements. In fact, the request for proposal specified a design that could be added onto. The first module is what's called a dem developmental prototype, and that's 48 antennas in a 6x8 array. What you're looking at is the HARP site in Alaska, or at least about one-fifth of the HARP site. When this is completed, you'll see about 180 of these poles. Together, those 180 poles make up one single antenna designed along with these cross members and a wire mesh here to send all the information, all the radio frequency energy that is generated by these uh, trailers up into the ionosphere. As they acknowledge in their papers when they say, we don't know what'll happen when we push it to the next level of effects. The military record explains it as phase one um, of a multi-phase project. It's going to get bigger, it's going to continue, and, and that's again why we're concerned. There's always a limit 
to everything, although we don't know exactly where that limit is. We are surrounded and bombarded by millions of megawatts of natural energy because the sun blows a solar wind which crashes towards the Earth. Since the Earth is a giant magnet, the magnetic field called the magnetosphere protects us. Harp's original patents were designed to distort or alter the magnetosphere. It's interesting to compare humans and the Earth. The Earth is, has a magnetic field. Humans actually generate a magnetic field too, especially in our hearts and brains. Every cell in our body has a powerful magnetic substance called magnetite, which responds sensitively to magnetic fields in our environment. If HARP is altering the magnetosphere, which is the magnetic field of the Earth and all around it, surely this will have an effect on our health and on our physiology. HARP's combined antennae generate a focused billion-watt high-frequency radio beam, which penetrates the lower ionosphere and interacts with the currents of the auroral electrojet. During this modification, this pulsing beam stimulates the ionosphere, creating ELF waves which can move great distances through the lower atmosphere and penetrate into the Earth to find missile silos, underground tunnels, and communicate with hidden submarines. There's a current flowing through here yes. called the auroral electrojet. You deposit energy in there, you're changing the medium, okay, and you're changing the current, and you're generating ELF and VLF waves. In simple terms, the electrojet is a river of electricity high above us. And a paper that I've read recently adds to the indications that they intend to cause it to dip down closer to the earth so it can be tapped for a huge electrical power generating station, which is insanity because they don't know what they're dealing with. They're dealing with the planet's electrical system. The electrojet affects global weather. Sometimes during a magnetic storm, for instance, it touches the Earth. It can knock out telephone cables and power grids. What HARP is, is capable of doing is to modify the electrojet. By modifying the electrojet, that, that current in the ionosphere, it has a capability of generating low-frequency waves. What essentially uh, the system does that's different is instead of the radio frequency energy dissipating as it goes up from the antenna array, it's actually focused. And the larger the antenna array, the higher they can focus the energy. And once they get the energy up into the ionosphere, depending on, on what they want to do, they can um, create a secondary frequency causing the ionosphere to vibrate, sending that signal back down to the Earth. And what that essentially does is allow them the ability to uh, communicate at very high data rates with uh, submarines, also allows for the um, possibility of Earth penetrating tomography, or in the vernacular, uh, would be like X-raying the Earth or looking into the Earth several kilometers deep. I heard uh, one of the scientists point out they can make these ELF waves penetrate the Earth and get an image when that comes back. When I did this in 85, that kind of capability did not exist. We, in fact, are doing experiments, or plan to do experiments, to see if we can detect tunnels underground. There is a way of being able to use this type of technology to, to be able to look for minerals that can be just below the surface of the earth. Uh, oil, gas, uh, different types of ore. HARP can be used to explore oils or gold mine and the like. Basically because the signal, low frequency signal can penetrate deeper into the earth or the water or the ocean than the high frequency signal. But this same kind of signal, signals in the same frequency range, can affect uh, human mood. The human brain operates on very low frequencies. For example, when we're thinking, I mean, uh, actively, uh, we're generating about 13, 14 cycles per second. When we're meditating, we're generating eight cycles per second. And when we're asleep, uh, the brain waves are running at about four cycles per second. And HARP is capable of generating all of these frequencies. These kinds of signals can control the human brain. And if you can control these frequencies and multiples of these frequencies and various combinations, you can control all kinds of emotions. You can generate happiness. You could generate uh, uh, sadness. You can generate any mood you want. We are immersed in ELF waves. And those, as far as I know, don't. Maybe they are affecting us, but <laughs> um, 
But, but these waves are minuscule compared to those. You know, the issue of you know, ELF, extremely low frequencies affecting um, mental states of, of individuals is not new. It goes back to Yale University and the work of Jose Delgado, which is well recognized in the literature. He started first using implants uh, in the brain. He then um, used radio frequency with implants and eventually he found that energy at one fiftieth of what the earth naturally produces could in fact in certain frequency ranges trigger uh, huge mood swings. I know the, the physical effect but not the biological effect. It's, it's, a, it's a different area. I was considered a child prodigy in electronics. My entire life has been devoted to the study of the effects of electromagnetic energies on the human mind. When I was 13 years old, I invented a device that transmits sound to the human brain using electromagnetic waves. So this is my field. I've been studying this field for over 40 years. And harp scares me because I know what it can do. I know that harp can be used to control the human mind. I'm not sure that the people involved with HARP are aware that humans are made up of energy, that the energy fields of Earth and humans are closely aligned. I, I don't even understand what you mean by energy. Humans are made up of energy. What does that mean? Humans are like balls of energy. We're made up of electricity and magnetic energy, just like the Earth. Are humans made up of energy? Well, what do they say, we're 90% water? Uh, but the rest of it is an electrochemical, and that, that's a form of energy, yes. All living things are exquisitely sensitive to some of the lowest levels of energy. We just couldn't imagine this. And it's been the subject of hot debate. How can life be so sensitive to the tiniest amounts of energy? But because this is how we are bioregulated, by virtue of tiny energy transactions within our body and also coming from the Earth, this is indeed the case. There are many different electromagnetic uh, projects and technologies out there that are affecting our health today. This document from Maxwell Air Force Base lays out um, the use of electromagnetic weapons technologies for debilitating human beings. Using electromagnetic warfare against human beings, you can cause disease, you can cause hysteria, or you can cause passivity for population control. Extremely low frequencies affect us because they are the same frequencies that our brains output. And when they're in the environment around us, our brains try to entrain to them. So our brains try to mimic those signals. And if those signals are not uh, good ones for our behavior, then we can fall apart. We can behave differently. We could get sick. We could feel very stressed and not know why. Once in a while when you have a power outage, uh, most people can identify the fact that they have a release of tension. The minute the electricity goes out, they feel an inner relaxation, a tension release, and when the power goes back on, the tension returns. So this is something uh, that most of us can feel. Everyone has a certain sensitivity to electromagnetic waves. It's just that some people are more sensitive than others. The symptoms that I discovered in my research caused by electromagnetic frequencies are anxiety, depression, diarrhea, dizziness, uh, extreme fatigue, headaches, lightheadedness, mood swings, nausea, nighttime increase in urination, uh, pulse rate, a sudden increase, shortness of breath, tingling, prickling feeling of the skin, vertigo, nosebleeds, blood pressure increase, and body tremors. You can also cause cancer. You can disrupt the genetic structure of our cells. Um, you can cause long-term damage in terms of mutagenic damage over generations, or you can cause very short-term damage, and you can also, you can actually cause somebody to just have their cells fall apart and hemorrhage to death. I found from people who were writing me and calling me from all over the country that they were suffering from either one or all of these same symptoms, and every single one of them lived next, uh, close by to a transmitter. Do you know this, from Harp to Gwyn, to these towers that are all over the United States now? Gwyn stands for Ground Wave Emergency Network. In nuclear attack, the ionosphere would be essentially destroyed by air bursts of nuclear weapons, and there wouldn't be any reflection, and all communication links would go out was thought of as an emergency backup communication link uh, in case of nuclear attack.
the weapons technologies are changing so dramatically at this particular time, it'd be like equating um, introduction of gunpowder to the West or the beginning of the atomic age earlier this century. And that's what's happening with electromagnetic weapons technologies today. The Air Force Phillips Laboratory is the Air Force's primary laboratory for doing space research. And that involves things like HARP, studying the ionosphere. Uh, anything the Air Force needs for space, we, we look into. And that includes weapons for space application, one of which is developing plasma toroids, projectiles made of plasma, essentially the atmosphere of stars, being able to harness that energy and to be able to fire it at a target. Uh, we have a device called Shiva. Shiva is a large capacitor bank. Capacitors store electrical energy. And then in a very short time, we release that energy. In about two one hundred millionths of a second, we will release the same amount of energy as the entire U.S. electrical production for that same instant in time, where the, the electrons rip from their orbits and you have a, a soupy, gaseous mixture, thousands of degrees hot. Potentially a, a very serious weapon. Electromagnetic warfare can also be used in coordination with ionospheric warfare. After I had actually left the program in 1987, one of the last communications I had uh, uh, with ARCO indicated that there had been a contract awarded for ionospheric warfare studies. I have not heard of ionospheric warfare. I don't even know what the term means. <laughs> in other words, using the ionosphere as an amplifier and as a broadcast medium. What we're actually doing with the ionosphere at that point is we're not just reflecting a signal, we are amplifying the signal. We are causing it to become much, much more intense, hundreds of thousands of times more intense than it would have been otherwise. We're broadcasting that signature over a large area of the Earth. HARP says it's not producing a weapon. HARP cannot be used as a weapon. Some of our critics have argued that HARP is only the beginning and could be a major weapon system. That just isn't true. What HARP is, is basically a ground-based Star Wars weapon technology. I'm the Attorney General and Environmental Program Manager for the Upper Cook Inlet Environmental Protection Consortium. And we've been working on HARP for many years. And they've located HARP at Gakona because of the magnetosphere is closest to the surface of the Earth. And they need that magnetic pole to do their uh, shots into the ionosphere and stratosphere with HARP and however long it's been uh, on the drawing board, the people here haven't known about it that long. And it changed from one thing to another. And what a lot of people are not aware of is it's ground-based Star Wars technology. And the United States Congress has said that they quit funding Star Wars. So they call it everything else but Star Wars to get it funded. I just don't know whether it's an outgrowth of Star Wars. The application described in the 1991 patent would be such that if anybody were to fire a missile from any direction, anywhere, to another point on Earth, it would intersect this relativistic layer and be uh, basically exploded. I've never been asked whether this is an outgrowth of Star Wars or not. As a scientist, you do like to be recognized for things you've done. And because I couldn't write to the press, I'm under ARCO confidentiality, I sent a letter to Laud Cook, the chairman of the board of ARCO, and received actually a very nice letter back uh, uh, complimenting me for my contributions and assuring me that they would inform the heart people of my contribution. There was never any intention to build uh, anything associated with what Mr. Eastland uh, had proposed in his patent. If you read the patents, I was thinking of ways to use it defensively. One was as an anti-satellite uh, device. You could make these electrons in space and hurt a satellite. Uh, that could be used either for offense or defense. We could hurt the enemy's communications while maintaining ours. And I was interested to note that that was one of the things said in the HARP uh, basic technical document. Star Wars was the state-of-the-art military technology of the 80s. But in the 90s and in the new millennium, it's going to be electromagnetic warfare. What we do know about um, uh, electromagnetic systems and electromagnetic warfare is becoming even more interesting. As late as April 28, 1997, U.S. Secretary of Defense Cohen announced uh, at Georgia, uh, University of Georgia 
that, in fact, uh, geophysical warfare was becoming a more um, intense problem. In fact, they even speculated that terrorist organizations would have systems that could modify weather, create volcanic eruptions, or even cause earthquakes using electromagnetic waves. You know, earthquakes is another thing. We have had a lot of them, a lot of volcanoes more in the last few years. Uh, whether or not that is just a cycle of uh, happenings, because we've had, his we've had a history of earthquakes and volcanoes throughout uh, the recorded history. But it just seems to me like that it's coming more, more often. Uh, and that there has to be some connection with some of the things that we as humans are doing uh, to our Earth. The issue of earthquakes has been, you know, looked at by other specialists, even going back to the work of J.F. Gordon MacDonald when he was at UCLA in the late 60s. He was also a science advisor, Lyndon Johnson. He's a specialist in geophysical warfare. He asserted then, if you could ever get enough energy in at just the right frequency and just the right waveform, you could, in fact, trigger these kinds of events. And I think that's exactly what uh, the Secretary of Defense, Cohen, was saying just a few days ago, was it's this idea that now terrorists may possess this kind of technology. It's obvious. I mean, if, if we're concerned that terrorists have it, we certainly do. Back in 1912, Nikola Tesla said it was possible to split the planet by combining the correct vibrations with the resonance of the planet itself. The idea of, of affecting weather for many people, it gets to the point where you say, well, you know, can that even be real? And when you go back in time, even to 1976, the United States, along with over 60 other countries, signed an accord where we agreed uh, to not use weather uh, manipulation as a weapon of war. This is before biological and chemical treaties, before many of the nuclear disarmament treaties. And yet, that was such a big threat in 76. Has the science progressed? Certainly. We're in this sea of energy. We're in a sea of gases. We're in a sea of particles that are charged. And they're moving constantly, just like a current in the ocean, just like the wind in the atmosphere. This current forms. And you draw and you attract these particles. Well, Wilhelm Reich attracted these particles. He pointed it at the sky and he said, you want clouds to be built there? You got a drought? He would point the device at that place and clouds would form there. In the 40s, there was interest in weather modification, that by the 50s, there was actual experimentation in that area. By the 1960s, that area had advanced substantially. Well, there have been programs with the salting cloud, you know, salting things with the silver iodide, and uh, there's been some experiments where people from airplanes threw chaff out, the little pieces of metal, and tried to get those to absorb power. We have done such damage to the thermal balance, to the hydrologic balance of this planet at this point. We are seeing more and more disasters. You have to watch the news. You have to notice these things. You can't just take Prozac and, and forget about it. And the next day you see the, oh yeah, the whole, Ohio, the whole Ohio River Valley was just flooded. Billions of dollars of damage. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people left without homes. And they actually say, that they can make weather. Well, tell me, have you noticed any good weather here lately? The thing that people don't take into account is we are changing the entire density of our atmosphere, the viscosity of the atmosphere, the atmosphere's ability to flow and be fluid, to be freely flowing. We're changing that. Today we have a number of technologies, not just HARP, but satellites and other ionosphere heaters placed in strategic locations all over the world that cre can create the disruptions in lightning. Here's a paper that was recently unearthed that talks about creating what's called a highly ionized column up through the atmosphere. Uh, it might trigger lightning. If, if lightning was ready to, to occur and suddenly this conductor was thrust in the middle of, you know, into the, into the situation, uh, then yeah, it could. If you beam this radio wave into the ionosphere and you continually charge it up, not only are you sending energy into the ionosphere, but you're providing a path for energy to come back down out of the ionosphere. In other words, they can create a massive discharge of lightning bigger than anything we've ever seen on this planet. And if you aim the beam at the um, down, and it happens to be in a region where there's a lot of charge, you can initiate a discharge in that area, perhaps. Once a solar tap is formed and the ionosphere actually discharges, the electrons and 
energy will come from all over the ionosphere to that one point and it will strike the ground in a bolt that is a hundred times greater than any lightning bolt imaginable. And it will not just strike one time, it will strike 30 to 40 times a second until there are not any, any longer electrons or energy to flow from the ionosphere through that tap to ground. But when it strikes the ground, it will vaporize the ground, the water, or whatever it happens to hit kind of like three or four Mount St. Helens volcanoes going off each second that that bolt discharges. Now, admittedly, that's kind of far-fetched, but whenever you're doing experimentation and you're taking risks with large amounts of energy, you must responsibly look at the worst-case scenario, and that could be the worst-case scenario. Well, you know, everyone has to remember that the Earth is a living organism, uh, a lot of living organisms, and things change. To not change is dead. Uh, and I believe that we are uh, all electrically connected. And so when you start playing around with electricity, you're going to affect everything. And so I think we need to be very careful uh, as to what we do, especially affecting humans, animals, and other life forms. Well, animals and birds are incredibly sensitive to electromagnetic energies. Heart will not affect animals or birds. Uh, that's in the environmental impact statement. What I've heard about HARP is that it can punch a hole through the atmosphere if they wanted to and that it could disturb the migratory bird pattern. It'll mess with like traditional village life who depend on the b birds to for their food and everything. They shouldn't even build the machine if they don't know what it can do because what if they just totally destroy the Earth with this heart machine? What are they going to think then? I think the biggest thing that scares me is that they don't know what they're doing. They're just trying it out. We don't know the results, and that's why we experiment. When people say they've never done this before, there's a lot of experiments that haven't been done. That doesn't mean we should get up and do them. I mean, none of us have put a gun to our head just to see what would happen either. Every uh, scientific experiment involves surprises of that sort, and some of them uh, very much alter what the purposes had been at the outset. I don't think it needs examples because it's such a commonplace phenomenon. That ghostly shading on the bridge walk is the only remaining evidence of what was once a man. The bomb blast consumed his body entirely but cast his imprint on the stones where he stood to meet his fate. The bomb will not start a chain reaction in the water, converting it all to gas and letting all the ships on all the oceans drop down to the bottom. It will not blow out the bottom of the sea and let all the water run down the hole. It will not destroy gravity. I am not an atomic playboy. Will you tell them that the United States government now wants to turn this great destructive force into something good for mankind, and that this experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction. We attended at Bikini the Mike shot, which was the first uh, fusion bomb. And the uh, manufacturers of the bomb thought it would be about seven megatons equivalent of explosive power. It turned out to be 15.4 megatons of explosive power. Their island was much more contaminated than had been presumed. And the radiation from that weapon contaminated the ocean. It's just like with DDT, remember? They, we were told that mm -hmm. that wasn't harmful, and they drove through the streets and actually sprayed DDT from trucks on school children while they were eating lunch. Is HARP 100% safe? Um, I don't think I would categorize uh, any radio transmitting system as 100% safe. Um, we have made it as safe as we can. Uh, we have followed all the um, standards. Uh, 
that are applicable? There are no standards because we have no intimate knowledge of how Earth and life work together. Many times we've experimented on various different things and then it didn't turn out the way we expected it to. It can get as big as what's been determined to be safe in the environmental impact statement. It can't go any bigger than that. Uh, the environmental impact statement was funded by the Air Force and the Navy, the people that are running the program. When you look at the Earth itself, you think about the Earth and how it releases energy naturally. You can look at earthquakes and what we know about them over 30 years is they're increasing in depth, frequency, and magnitude. You can look at weather patterns. And what everyone knows, at least in this country and most of the world now, is weather patterns are going through dramatic shifts uh, that are blamed on any number of factors. And you can also look at uh, tidal heights in the North Sea, which have been steadily rising over a 30-year period as it's been charted. All of that indicates releases of energy. And then in the midst of this um, natural releases of energy, we're going to inject billions of watts of power uh, into the magnetic lines of force. What this will do, they don't really know, because they've never been at these power thresholds before. Safety is the main consideration here. Aircraft safety, uh, radio frequency safety, um, the environmental impact statement is the governing document and anybody uh, that has a, an environmental concern that we have not addressed in this um, should come to us and let us know about it. There's no independent um, scientific committee looking at this outside of the military. There is no physiologist or bioscientist involved in this project from the military looking at those bio effects. We think it's a narrowly focused um, uh, program in the sense that it's, the bulk of it is military driven. That's what's driving the budgets and that's what's driving the program. The military research is one line of work and I would say the, the medical research is another line of work, and for most part, these two groups are not talking to one another. There are a number of, of scientists like myself who are concerned about this, who are in fear of what HARP could do to the planet. Not only uh, mind control, but weather changes, uh, possible earth changes, earthquakes, things like that. And we all need to band together. We need to, to contact each other over the Internet. We need to lead a discussion on this, and scientists need to contact their government representatives and tell them what they feel about this. Our, our critics have, have talked about uh, HARP and, and some of the problems they perceive. Uh, if anyone, any group, individuals, whatever, uh, were, were concerned, um, th they're welcome to tour the site, they're welcome to, to put together an independent team of, of their experts to come onto the site and to review what it is we're doing. We have absolutely nothing to hide. We need to bring in people from all walks of life to study the possible consequences of this technology. We don't know the effects. I don't think we should move blindly forward and just do these experiments. We were recently invited to Brussels to speak to a group of um, parliamentarians in an organization called Global International. And we were able to present HARP as an issue to over 60 parliamentarians from 40 countries. And what was important is it really was the first time many of these folks had heard um, much about this project. But I can tell you that the international interest has been growing. The scientific community is um, starting to wake up to the issue. And what we're seeing is more people willing to go forward and speak out. I'm concerned that the people who understand that all life is interconnected, aren't the people that are making the decisions about these experiments on our ionosphere. What air I breathe, everybody else breathes. Water and air and the land are life. Let's do what we have to do to protect it. As living systems, we're open systems, and we can't draw the line between where our boundary stops and where the boundary of the non-living domain begins. The Earth is a living organism. It's not something that's really outside of us. It's really an intimate part of who we are. And when we destroy it, we destroy ourselves. I have always asked that and if anybody has uh, a problem, come, come and let us see what the problem is. And if it's something we haven't addressed that we should have, of course we'll address it.
the problem with government and the people right now is that people don't trust the government and they have good cause not to because so many times over the years uh, they've not told them the truth. Well, the planet's electrical system is not there for us to exploit for Department of Defense purposes. It's there as a part of a whole beautiful, harmonious, interconnected system that supports all life on this planet. And we don't know everything that there is to know about it. It's not up to me to determine that it is or is not a valid expenditure of taxpayers' funds. That's not my, it's not my uh, call. And if Congress gives us the funds, uh, evidently they, uh, they believe it's worthwhile. I'm told to do this, and we are doing it. Those people who are in government, they tell me a lot of times that they're just following orders. My response is so was Heinrich Himmler. He was just following orders. We're about to embark on another arms race. It's totally unnecessary. We're committing billions of dollars to this technology. And the question becomes is, where does it end? I mean, we spent, they figured, uh, $3 trillion on the entire nuclear adventure. And that's, you know, 60% of the current national debt. Are we going to start that cycle again? Is it necessary to do that again? There's, there's just no sense to make more of HARP than there already is. It, it's intended to be for research. And that's all. So even though HARP is small today, it really, every major weapons program was small at its infancy. It's just we usually don't find out about them until 50 years later. In this case, we're finding out at the beginning phase. And this is a time for people to take and pay attention and look at this technology and determine, is this really a direction we want to go? And is it really necessary right now? HARP is not a threat. It's a benefit. We also know that there are other very specific frequencies which are different from the war games frequencies which can enhance healing, which can accelerate natural healing in our bodies, which can alleviate our mood disorders, which can help us get over depression, anxiety, and sleeplessness. The military has very different plans and asks different questions looking at the same system than the scientist who's interested in medical issues or healing the planet. It may not be that the Earth will die, but we will not be able to sustain human life on this planet if we continue to add one element of destabilizing technology after another. If we do not stand up for what we believe in, for the children, we're not doing our job. Perhaps true wisdom lies in knowing our limitations and that even the laws of nature are uncertain. In view of these technologies, we're left to wonder, do these experiments jeopardize our long-term survival?